Good afternoon and welcome to all of you. We are so glad that you were able to come with us here today. My name is Rich Lyons. I am the dean here at Berkeley's Haas School of Business. It's my privilege to welcome all of you and you will get a welcome shortly to our wonderful guest here today. Uh, we're also very glad that we could make this event to, available to so many that are, are watching it uh, real time via our web streaming. So welcome to all of you as well. Our Dean Speaker Series at Berkeley Haas is our highest level speaker series. Many of you have participated in it before. We've had a wonderful run this last uh, spring, and of course, there's going to be a wonderful run in the fall coming up. So please be looking out for another wonderful line of great speakers. And one other note before we get started, that we want to make sure you also have access with some questions uh, for Vice President Gore. And we will have uh, cards that you can uh, sign on to, question cards. They'll be gathered, brought up here, because the second part of the event here is a question and answer fireside chat, and that will include your questions. So be looking out for the, for the question cards. Um, let me also mention that our event today is co-sponsored by the Haas School of Business, as I mentioned, and also our Institute for Business and Social Impact at the Haas School, or what we call IBSI. Um, I'll, in just a moment, I'll turn the microphone over to Laura Tyson. She is uh, the head of our Institute for Business and Social Impact. Uh, it was launched in 2013, in fact, by her, and it is a collection of some of our most important social impact assets at the Haas School. Uh, most of you know Laura Tyson. I'll give you just a, a quick introduction to her and also the Institute. The Institute's mission is to inspire and empower members of the Berkeley Haas community to develop innovative solutions to press, pressing social and environmental challenges. Uh, our school, Berkeley Haas, has had a long history of leadership in this area, and IBSI is a wonderful uh, concentration of that leadership, whether it's corporate social responsibility or nonprofit and public leadership and many, many other elements of that. During her tenure as dean, Laura was dean of the Haas School in a prior life, and she is currently on our faculty <laughs> now. Uh, during her tenure, she was actually instrumental in renewing the Haas School's uh, commitment, both teacher teaching and research around uh, social responsibility in business, and it is only fitting that she launch and is now currently leading our Institute for Business and Social Impact. She became a professor at UC Berkeley in 1977. She has been on the Haas faculty. <laughs> Since 1990, uh, from 1993 to 1996, she worked, as you know, in the Clinton White House. Um, she was during that time. She worked closely also with Vice President uh, Al Gore. During her tenure, she served as the President Clinton's national economic advisor. She was a key architect of President Clinton's domestic and international economic policy agenda during his term, uh, first term in office. Today, she continues her work in Washington as a member of President Obama's. Recovery Advisory Board, also an advisor and on many uh, boards in both Fortune 500 and nonprofit organizations. Uh, she is a leader on so many fronts. Uh, I'll first introduce and let's all welcome our own Laura Tyson. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I thank you very much for those very kind remarks, Rich. Um, I do not want to take up any time because we have a limited time with one of the people who I think is the greatest visionaries I have been privileged to meet in my lifetime. And that's the word that came to me this morning when I was trying to think about what word captures the essence of this person. And it is visionary. And it is visionary on so many fronts. We all know about the visionary perspective on the climate front. You know, when I first arrived in, in Washington, one of the very first conversations I had was with Vice President Gore, and it was about carbon, and it was about how economists were not measuring correctly the social cost of economic growth. And he was absolutely right. And he has been championing that, by the way, visionary. When did he start to work on this? Well, I don't know if it was 1977. Uh, you may have been a mere child then, like I was. <laughs> no, I, I but was. He started working on this when he was a college student. Okay, so let's. This is a lifetime of visionary work on the climate. We know about it in terms of the book *Inconvenient Truth*, the movie *Inconvenient Truth*, the Nobel Prize in 2007 for informing the planet about the dangers of climate change. But I want to point out that Vice President Gore is a visionary on 
other issues as well. Many, many other issues. We just had a fascinating conversation, you can read this in his book, Assault on Reason, for example, about American democracy and about the role of technology in changing the way our democratic system can work. He has been a complete visionary on technology. I was, again, sitting in uh, the Council of Economic Advisors in 1994, and he comes by to show me to show me the internet and to tell me I have to put all of the council's information on the internet. I was kind of resistant to that idea. You know, I had, I had enough to do. Did I really have to put all of government document? If you think about it today, we are not a country that's at the frontier of the use of digital technology with our electorate, our population. We need to be, and that vision really started with Vice President Gore. I could go on, there are many, many areas of being visionary. Uh, let me just end with the notion, this is someone who has been a dedicated public servant for, what's the number of years? 24 years, eight of which were at the highest level at the Vice President of the United States. Um, he then moved to become a leader, an absolute leader, in the private sector, both nonprofit and for profit, uh, looking for the solutions that can help us with the technology, become a better informed electorate, deal with climate change, looking for business solutions on sustainability. He's not just the chairman of Generation Investment. Generation Investment, which is one of the most successful long term sustainability investment opportunities in the world, was created by Vice President Gore and his colleague David Blood. So you have the opportunity today to hear from a true visionary leader on a wide variety of issues committed to making society a better place and a leader in both the public and the private sector. We should all be inspired to go out and continue all of the fights that Vice President Gore has been fighting for his entire life. Let me introduce Thank you very President. much. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't want to ruin the impression that Laura has created here by, by saying anything now. Uh, there's an old, uh, you probably heard this story a million times, but uh, the former Speaker of the House many years ago, Jim Wright, used to tell the story after a, an over-the-top introduction like that one. I, you, I just wish my mother and father could have heard that. My father <laughs> would have enjoyed it and my mother would have believed it. But, uh, <laughs> and, and listening to those uh, references to when we first started working together in, in, uh, in, in 1992, November and December of 1992, when Bill Clinton asked me to sit at a small table with him and two staff members and we <laughs> spent weeks and weeks and weeks putting together all the personnel in the administration and I took it upon myself to find a top level uh, you know tier one economist who got technology and who understood uh, environment and that's where my vetting process uh, turned up Laura's name first and foremost, and I was so happy that she agreed to come uh, and, and join the Council of Economic Advisors and then run the whole economic show uh, there in the White House. And we have become very close friends. Her husband, Eric, is a great uh, playwright and author, and her son, now watch her smile when I mention her son, <laughs> Elliot, is just the greatest guy in the world. And, uh, he is a brilliant guy who was one of my uh, two principal researchers on that book that she mentioned, The Assault on Reason, a few years ago. And Elliot just got married and is going, going uh, on great guns. Anyway, listening to all those references to the old days, I'm reminded, this is a true story, not long ago, I was in a restaurant uh, with a business partner and um, a woman came walking in front of the table just staring at me as she walked past. And, I didn't think anything of it until a few minutes later I saw out of the corner of my eye the same woman was coming from the opposite direction <laughs> and just staring at me. And I, so I, I looked up and said, how do you do? And she took two steps forward and she said, you know, if you dyed your hair black, you would look just like Al Gore. <laughs> and, uh, 
I said, why, thank you. And uh, she said, you sound like him, too. Anyway, Laura has uh, graciously been a member of the advisory board on generation investment management, and I'm not going to talk about my investment firm here today, but uh, I'm grateful for the chance that we have to continue, right. that I have to continue learning uh, from her and, and working with her. And Dean Lyons, thank you so much for inviting me here. This uh, uh, tremendous uh, school uh, is world-renowned, of course, and I have a personal connection to one of the students here, uh, Zach Knight, who I was looking forward to seeing today, but he and his fellows out of all, out of 300 entries from business school student groups uh, all over, won the top prize on uh, a sustainability business plan and is, <laughs> and uh, so Zach and his colleagues are down in um, LA at the Milken Conference right now right. accepting that uh, great award. Right. So. Haas Business School goes uh, to the pinnacle once again. Um, you know, I, there's so much that I would like to talk to you about. Uh, Laura really was over the top in uh, uh, talking about visionary, but it made me think, okay, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and tell you, give you uh, three quick stories about vision as it applies to business, as it applies to economics, as it applies to the recognition of what is valuable in our lives together. In generation investment management, we had a founding metaphor. Uh, we had founding principles and goals and a vision and so forth, but there was a metaphor that we always repeated. And it's a little geeky, it's a, based on a scientific image that all of you have seen, I saw it in grade school or high school, I can't remember, it's been so long, but it was, uh, w when, when you studied the electromagnetic spectrum, bear with me now, <laughs> it was typically a long, thin rectangle uh, that had the different wavelengths from the longest uh, radio waves to the shortest gamma radiation and microwaves and ultraviolet and infrared and visible light and all of the various uh, wavelengths in between. And the one startling moment in that uh, lesson plan that I remember, and a lot of people do, is that the, the portion of that spectrum made up of visible light is really a tiny portion of the spectrum, less than 1%. Uh, and of course, human nature being what it is, we naturally begin to assume that that's all that matters. And since we have uh, eyes and 70% of our brains are assigned to the optical systems, uh, we, and everybody else does the same thing, we just, okay, that's it, we'll operate on that part of the spectrum. Well, for the eight years I was in the White House, I, I had the unusual experience uh, that presidents and vice presidents have of starting every single day with about an hour with the intelligence community. And you may have read in recent press stories that they actually collect information from the entire spectrum. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yes, the, the pictures, images, portrayals of reality that they presented every morning were way more complete because they drew on the entire spectrum. Now, why am I telling you that story? Because in business uh, and in many areas of life, we are wired uh, so that we naturally, for conservation of energy, uh, the, the geeky word heuristics, we find shortcuts and just quickly begin to assume, okay, we're gonna deal with that. We're not gonna worry about all the other stuff. So quarterly reports from businesses, the numbers uh, that stream over the Bloomberg terminals, uh, they, present a very coherent, if incomplete, view of businesses, business performance, investment opportunities, but actually there is a much larger part of the value spectrum that's left out of those streams of numbers. Um, when BP was uh, going great in the stock market, most investors didn't look at their safety culture 
or their environmental uh, monitoring process because it wasn't on the Bloomberg screens. But when the Deepwater Horizon blew up, the investors that had not looked at that lost a ton of money and are now at risk of losing uh, even more. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the great psychologist and philosopher of value, Abraham Maslow, has a little throwaway phrase uh, that all of you have heard. If the only tool you have, have is a hammer, every problem begins to look like a nail. To, to parlay that into this uh, discussion, if the only tool you use to measure value is a price tag, then those things that don't come with price tags attached can begin to look as if they have no value. What about the cleanliness of the air and the water, the beauty of a sunset? These are all cliched examples, but what about the, uh, a business's treatment of its employees? What about uh, their reputation in the communities where they operate? What about the practices of their, uh, in, in their supply chain? We've all seen lots of examples, and maybe you have been involved in social media helping to beat the drum on examples where some big company has uh, uh, allowed some outrageous practices in their supply chain and you demand that they do something about it. Well, that is uh, an example of how the rest of the value uh, spectrum is beginning to be recognized as relevant to the way we define what is good and what is bad, what is progress and what is not uh, in our business practices, in our economic policies, and in the way uh, we make decisions about our collective future. Of course, gross domestic product, this is kind of a cliche by now, but I'm assuming, assuming that all of you know this. <coughs> Excuse me, most business accounting practices are derived from the national accounts that were completed in the uh, late 1930s. A man named Simon Kuznets was honored for creating uh, GDP. Uh, and it's interesting because when you go back and look at those days, he gave speeches when he was honored by saying, and he said in all his speeches, most of them, please don't use GDP as a way to guide <laughs> economic policy. And why did he say that? Because he knew as the creator of it, what was left out. It didn't include, for example, distribution of income and wealth. And that's not a call for redistributionist policies, which are supposed to be so uh, terrible. Uh, but it, it is a recognition that something's left out if we just measure uh, the whole and not uh, where it is going. So a couple of quarters ago, GDP in the US went up 3.5%, but median income went down 3%. And the fact that 90% plus of the extra value added to the economy since the Great Depression did really and truly go to the top 1%, mm -hmm. the majority of it to the top one-tenth of 1%, mm -hmm. uh, that has meaning. And so when GDP goes up, people go, yay, great, we're doing great. But the average family is saying, what? I can't pay my bills. We can't put food on the table and also do the other things we want to do for our kids and for our own future. So the rise of inequality in the United States and in most countries in the world uh, is a serious problem. And we're not measuring it because it's a part of the value spectrum that we don't measure. We've adopted these accounting systems as a heuristic and we have chosen to ignore the rest. Uh, the depletion of natural resources is not included in GDP. No. So we have a groundwater crisis. And with the drought in California, uh, lots of folks are doubling down, trying to withdraw more groundwater. Out of sight, out of mind, soon out of water. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the generation of pollution uh, is an externality, the famous buzzword, because it's not included in these accounting structures. So for example, the climate crisis. We put 110 million tons of global warming pollution into the thin shell of atmosphere surrounding our planet every 24 hours, as if it's an open sewer. No problem, right? Well, actually problem, because the uh, accumulated amount of that global warming pollution has now reached a, uh, a volume and density that it traps as much extra heat energy 
into the Earth's atmosphere every single day as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs going off every 24 hours. Mm. It's a big planet, but that's a lot of energy. And 90% of it is going into the oceans. Uh, and so we get these much stronger storms. Uh, most recently, a few weeks ago, uh, super cyclone Pam wiped out 90% of Vanuatu's uh, capital city buildings, devastated that country. One year ago, super typhoon Haiyan became the strongest storm ever to make landfall because it crossed areas of the Pacific that were three and a half degrees Celsius warmer than normal. And that's what added to its destructive power. Two, two and a half years ago in New York City, Superstorm Sandy crossed areas of the Atlantic to the windward of New, New York and New Jersey that were nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. And so it became a devastating storm. And unfortunately, these examples uh, can be listed almost every week. These extreme hot temperatures that drive these events are 100 times more common now than they were 40 years ago. Uh, and so, you know, and there's a confusion between uh, linear single cause, single effect, and systemic cause and effect. So when you have temperatures going up, you disrupt the water cycle. Uh, and you get much more evaporation off the oceans into the atmosphere. And uh, it, it, it's funneled toward the places where downpours are released. It's sort of like, to give a simple analogy, if you've got a bathtub full of water and you open the drain, the water rushing out the drain obviously doesn't come just from the part of the tub directly above the drain, it comes from the whole tub. And in the atmosphere, uh, these storms uh, collect water vapor from as much as 2,000 kilometers away, sometimes even more, and it's funneled toward the, where the drain is open by meteorological conditions. And so we get these giant downpours, and we get more floods, like the one in Pakistan that displaced 20 million people, further destabilizing a nuclear-armed country. Uh, three weeks ago in Chile, the worst flood they've ever had. Uh, and so, and you get these big snowfall events because we still have winter and when th there are these streams of water vapor coming, for example, from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up uh, North America to places in the Northeast where the conditions release snowstorms, you get snowmageddon or the snowpocalypse or a snowball on the Senate floor. Uh, and, uh, and the scientists say, yeah, uh, that's how it works. Uh, and uh, Japan's had the same thing, uh, uh, their version of uh, snow snowpocalypse uh, in the last few winters, the same, same phenomenon. And of course, the same extra heat also sucks the uh, moisture out of the first few centimeters of the soil, and so you get what we've got in California right now. With the snowpack, uh, uh, it didn't build up this, this year, and the, 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 the soil moisture is evaporated way more quickly. Uh, the, you know, the warm blobs in the Pacific and how they roll out to the drought, relate to the drought, that's above my pay grade. But whatever the scientists say are the collection of underlying conditions that contribute to this drought, the extra heat sucks the moisture out of the soil. And so California is facing some dire circumstances, and it'll adapt and survive, but it's facing dire circumstances, particularly agriculture, because of this historic drought. And it's far from the only place. Look at Brazil. The largest city in our hemisphere, Sao Paulo, is debating a rash water rationing scheme of two days on and five days off. Why? Well, it's the same underlying phenomena complicated by the destruction of the Amazon because they have flying rivers, as the Brazilian scientists call them, that, are, that go like slinkies across the Amazon toward the southeast where uh, Sao Paulo and, and Rio are. And you can go around the world and see uh, bigger downpours, bigger floods, bigger droughts, and rising seas because the cryosphere, the, the frozen parts of the planet, are melting. And particularly Greenland and Antarctica, especially West Antarctica, although now East Antarctica is uh, very much in play as well, uh, we, we see sea levels rising. I'm having a training program with the Climate Reality Project in Miami uh, this fall. Uh, and you know, there are parts of Miami, particularly Miami Beach right now, that when there's an unusually high tide, the water comes up in the, in the streets a foot or more. 
And, you know, they've got a governor that denies the climate crisis and a senator de that denies the climate crisis. Bright, sunshiny day, no rain for weeks, and they're sloshing through water up to their ankles saying, I don't notice anything. Do you notice anything? <laughs> I mean, it is ridiculous. I thought that President Obama was great in the White House Correspondents' Dinner. It was very, very funny. Was and really funny. Um, the, the anger a translator. I, it, 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 the anger translator was great. I thought that bit went a little long until he used it as a setup to express his own genuine anger about the way climate. the Congress is dealing with the climate <laughs> crisis. But in any, in, in any event, mm -hmm. I, once I got into the climate crisis, I had to tell you a little bit more uh, about that. And I'm, I'm going to return to that. But let me come back to where I was talking about vision and how the GDP gives us a distorted vision. It doesn't measure all of these things. Uh, now, I, I, I promise a second story. And this is a story that probably, it's about a video that probably all of you have seen on the internet. It involves a group of people, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 or so, and half of them are in white t-shirts and half of them are in black t-shirts and they're passing a medicine ball around among them. How many people have seen that video? Okay, uh, more than half of you haven't. I'm going to ruin it for you right now, but you can go <laughs> yeah. look it up. The moderator says, it only lasts about two minutes, and the moderator says, okay, your task is to count how many times someone in a white T-shirt touches this medicine ball. And they run the video, and they're moving around and everything, uh, and, it, and it ends, says, okay, what's your answer? And some people say 17, 16, 15. Okay, the correct answer is, I forget what it is, 16. Did anyone see the gorilla? And 95% of the people who watch this video and go through this exercise don't see a gorilla. But when they back it up and run it in slow motion, right in the middle of the circle where these people are passing the ball, a guy in a big gorilla suit walks out right in the middle of the circle and turns toward the camera and beats his chest and then turns and walks out the other side. Now, why do people not see the gorilla? It's something the psychologists call selective attention, and it relates to this spectrum metaphor. It relates to uh, incomplete ways of seeing something, because the truth is we don't see with our eyes, we see with our brains. And we have an amount of attention that is limited. And if we decide whether in response to an instruction from that moderator of the video, or whether in response to a set of incentives and compensation schemes in asset management or in business management, if we decide to focus selectively and intensively on a particular uh, phenomenon, and we just give all of our psychic energy over to seeing clearly and, and, and constantly what we're looking for, then we don't see gorillas that wander through the field of view. <laughs> And that's why, uh, that's why a lot of people did not see that uh, BP had had a pipeline accident uh, in Alaska and had a refinery fire in Texas and had a safety culture and an environment, uh, environmental culture that, was, that were both in shambles and they were an accident waiting to happen. They didn't see that because they were focused intently on the number streams that they had been told and had been incentivized to focus on as very important. That is why also when our policymakers in the, uh, in, in, in the government, in, at the local and state level, although Jerry, I'm a big fan of Jerry Brown, he's a, really an exception to all this, but it, most policymakers, they focus on things like GDP and they focus on these indicators that they are rewarded for managing in the news media, in the political culture, and since the measures don't collect and therefore do not empower us to see other things that are real important, but they're just not included in what we've decided to look at, then all these other things go wrong. So global GDP goes up, wahoo, but inequality goes up. We're now uh, nearing the levels of hyper inequality. Inequality is a little like inflation. It's always good to have a little bit. Inequality is a necessary condition for capitalism. But like inflation, you want a little bit, you've got to avoid the hyper variety of inflation. 
because it'll destroy your economy. Inequality a little bit is good and necessary. You've got to avoid the hyper inequality and that's where we're getting right now. And that will destroy the basis for both democracy and capitalism unless it's checked. Now, it can be uh, and, it, and it must be. But just as our eyes are instruments for funneling information that we then see with the brain, so are the extended instruments that we use for collecting data, like accounting systems, like uh, the technologies that we use to enhance our way of collecting data. Uh, like, and ideologies can, can put blinders on us. Uh, and in the same way, if we shift our way of looking at things, we can use new perspectives as instruments to enhance our vision. By using microscopes, we can see the small. By using supercomputers, we can uh, simulate the large. We can slow down the fast and speed up the slow. If we look for CO2 emissions, they happen to be invisible, tasteless, odorless. They have no price tag. So they're invisible, out of sight, out of mind, etc. But businesses that simulate a price, put a shadow price on carbon emissions, the stories are legion of CEOs and executive teams who have used that new way of seeing their operations to reveal inefficiencies that were also invisible before they started looking for the CO2 footprint. And I could give you lots and lots of examples uh, if we had time. Okay, let me, let me move on. Uh, I do want to say a few more words about the climate crisis. I want to, um, I want to say uh, there are really two questions that, that have to be answered. One is, must we change? We've been enjoying the benefits of a carbon-fueled economic growth surge for a century and a half, and particularly in the last half century. 85% of the world's energy comes from carbon-based fuels. And for all the problems we've got, wow, poverty's gone down. We've seen uh, this edifice of civilization that brings so many great benefits to us all. Looks like it might be a real pain in the neck to change uh, from our reliance on carbon-based fuel. Do we really have to change? Well, the scientific consensus has long been there, but uh, democracy's been hacked and our political system uh, is pathetic. Uh, and we are, it does not give us the ability to make policy on the basis of facts and logic because uh, we now have a system that is dominated by big money. I'm sorry if this sounds a little radical. I always heard as you get older, you get more conservative. I, I, it, it's really, it's kind of been the opposite for me, uh, just, just because I don't think I've moved. It is the opposite. Really, I don't, I don't think I've moved. I think that the system has decayed and become so degraded. It really it should be a source of alarm. Uh, and talking about putting the CEA uh, on the internet, we need to put democracy on the internet. Uh, we need to do for the climate issue and other large issues what was done for net neutrality and for SOPA and PIPA and for uh, the other victories that have been particularly important to netizens. We need to find ways to, to reinvigorate our democracy and put facts and logic and, and the best available evidence as judged by the mass of the, the literate who are paying attention put that back front and center instead of bowing down to these multi-billionaires who write a check and call the tune and watch the politicians just dance to whatever tune they want them to dance to. I said it was pathetic. It is an outrage. We are in danger of losing the vitality of our democracy. And the climate issue is exhibit A, but there are other issues uh, as well. And we better wake up. And this generation, it gives me so much optimism and hope. And I'm so glad the internet is coming along so strong and is beginning to challenge the dominance of this broadcast culture that displaced the printing press, which gave rise to the Enlightenment and the, the great software of the American Constitution, which allowed us to harvest the wisdom of crowds. We've lost that, but we can get it back. 
by moving the institutions and practices and forms of our representative democracy onto the internet where individuals once again will have a say and once again will have an opportunity to, to use logic and facts to connect with others who will hold up the best truth they're able to find and use it as a basis for power uh, as against big wealth and, uh, and the, the forms of power that are now in control today. But the first question is, do we have to change? Yes, we have to change. And the scientists should have, uh, what their consensus should have been the basis for a change. But because of the unfortunate demise, the, the unfortunate uh, degradation of American democracy, that hasn't happened. So we have to magnify our voices, but we have an ally, Mother Nature, because these extreme, these climate-related extreme weather events are now waking people up. They see this drought's different. They see those storms are different. They see the sea level rise, even if they're not, uh, even they're pretending they don't. They're seeing the disruption of the, the ocean currents and all seals coming up in southern California. They see the disruption of the wind currents and the polar vortex and all the, the strange atmospheric phenomena all over the world. In developing countries, the predictable pattern of rainfall that subsistence farmers rely upon is being disrupted. Food supplies are at risk for a variety of reasons connected to the climate crisis. Water supplies, I mentioned one reason, but there are other reasons as well. So nat Mother Nature is telling us very loudly and clearly, yes, we have to change. So what's the second question? The second question is, can we change? If we have to change, if, we, if it turns out we, it's impossible, it's just too big a task, uh, it, it's what uh, Yogi Berra meant when he said what we have here is an insurmountable opportunity. If we don't have the, the ability to change, then don't bother me about it. I don't want to hear about the climate crisis if there's no realistic chance of, of solving it. Because all that will do is give me the heebie-jeebies and keep me in a constant state of anxiety with no hope at the, <laughs> uh, at the end of the day. So let's party on. Uh, <laughs> let's just don't worry about it. But I bring you good news. We are going to solve the climate crisis. And I want to tell you why. Here in Silicon Valley, here in the Bay Area where the, the, the digital revolution uh, began and is thriving, we have learned over the last uh, 50 years since Gordon Moore first wrote that paper that became Moore's Law, we have learned that there are some areas of high technology that yield to concentrated research and development and the forces of competition. And they sometimes surprise us with the cost down curves that are so stunning we can hardly believe our eyes. And moreover, as the cost goes down radically, the, the quality goes up. Uh, exhibit A, all, all of y'all should have Apple products, I will tell you that. <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, you, you know, you, you all know the examples about Moore's Law, but there, there are plenty of other examples. Let me give you one quick one, a mundane one, cell phones. So I've always been uh, kind of an early adopter. Uh, I, I love technology, and uh, back around 1980, when I was in my third or fourth term in the House of Representatives, <clears throat> I got one of those first early cell phones. And some of you may have seen pictures of them, big, clunky, deals. I thought that was the coolest looking thing. <laughs> oh my God. And um, anyway, I, I, I went over to see a friend of mine in the Congress for dinner and called him. Well, when are you coming over? I'm knock, knock, knock. And he opened the door. It was like wild and crazy guys, you know. Wow, wow. You mean you can call while you're walking? What? <laughs> well, at that time, 1980, AT&T, then called Ma Bell, it was the only company then in telephones, they asked McKin they hired McKinsey to do a massive global market survey. How many of these things will we be able to sell in the year 2000? And they did their study and worked hard and came back and said 900,000, almost a million. You, by the year 2000, you'll be able to sell 900,000 of these things. <laughs> well, the year 2000 uh, arrived, and sure enough, they sold 900,000 of them in the first three days of that year. <laughs> <laughs> and when the year was up, the prediction was off by 120x. And today, there's 6.8 billion of these cell phones out there. Uh, and another 1.2 billion will be sold this year. So, why was 
And God bless McKenzie, I'm not picking on them. A lot of people had the same uh, a misperception. Why were they not only wrong, but way wrong? Number one, they did not, as we still often do not, fully comprehend the implications of these exponential cost down curves. When, when they open up and start and reach the inflection point, then it's Katie bar the door. And they didn't understand that the quality would go up at the same time. They didn't understand that the, that the purchasers were not big corporations or parastatals or government bureaucracies, but individuals. And they didn't understand that the majority of people that made up the market for these new phones lived in areas that did not have landline telephone grids. So they could just leapfrog the old technology, and they did. And now in sub-Saharan Africa, Virtually everybody has a phone, and that's not much of an exaggeration. And they do way more business and commerce and banking on their mobile phones than we do. Now, some of y'all uh, do more than them, I'm sure, but more than I do, and more probably than, uh, than, than, than Laura does. Mm -hmm. but, but, so why am I telling you this story? Look at solar photovoltaic cells and wind energy. In, in just uh, 10, 12 years ago, the predictions were that uh, wind energy would, in, would uh, reach 30 gigawatts uh, by the year 2010. Well, we reached 2010, we had 12 times as many gigawatts. What about solar? 10, 12 years ago, the, produ the prediction was that the world would reach an annual production capacity of one gigawatt per year by 2010. Well, we got to 2010 and we produced 17 gigawatts. Last year, we produced 48 gigawatts. This year, we're on track to produce 62 gigawatts of photovoltaics. So 62x is almost the same as that cell phone example, and, not, and in the same ballpark as what's been happening with computer chips. Turns out renewable energy and, renewable e and efficiency and, and now energy storage are areas of technology that yield to R&D and competition. And we are seeing a, the, the greatest business opportunity in the history of the world with the decarbonization of the economy, the use of widely distributed zero carbon energy resources, low carbon uh, energy systems all over the world. What's the fastest deploying country in the world for photovoltaics? Sweden, Germany? Bangladesh, two rooftop uh, systems per minute, night and day, every day. This is skyrocketing East Africa, West Africa, South Asia, South America. 350% year-on-year increase in South America last year. Another 350% increase underway this year. It's taking over. Why? Because the cost down curve has now reached the point that it's reached grid parity and it's gone below in many places. Now, I've only been in the business world for 14 years, but one of the things I've learned is that if you have a new product or service, it matters how expensive it is compared to the incumbent technology. Turns out that more expensive than is uh, different than cheaper than. Who knew? Uh, and <laughs> it, it's sort of like the difference between uh, 32 degrees and 33 degrees Fahrenheit, zero one Celsius. It's more than one degree. It's the difference between ice and water. And in markets, Cheaper than is a difference of more than just a, a, a penny a product. It's the difference between markets that are frozen up and capital that's liquid flowing into these new opportunities. For the last seven years, global aggreg aggregate investment in new electricity generating capacity from renewables has exceeded that from fossil fuels. And this past year, the delta just increased dramatically. So we are uh, going to, to win this. I'm very excited about it. And, um, I'm going to conclude. I'm sorry to go uh, overtime here, but I get kind of stirred up about this. Uh, and I'll, I'll just close by saying that uh, I'll close by telling you uh, just a couple of short stories from my childhood. When I was 13 years old, I heard President John F. Kennedy make that bold challenge to put a person on the moon, bring him back safely in 10 years. And I heard the adults of my of that day and time say that's a terrible mistake, expensive, waste of money. But eight years and two months later, Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. And the moment he did so, in Houston at NASA's Mission Control, a great cheer went up. And the average age of those systems engineers in that moment was 26 years old. Mm -hmm. Which means their age when they heard that <laughs> challenge 
averaged 18 years old. Now, y'all are older than that, but your generation has the ability to take on this challenge and be impatient. You've, we've got to win the conversation. We've got to change the way of thinking. We've got to raise awareness of the full spectrum of value, which includes the future of human civilization. And we've seen it happen with abolition, with women's rights, uh, universal suffrage, civil rights, uh, gay GLBT rights. A couple of years ago, there was an article out here in California with, uh, about two gay men waiting in line for a pizza. Uh, and some jerk walked along and made some homophobic comment. And according to the article, literally everybody in that line in turn said, shut up, we don't tolerate that anymore. This, we have to stop tolerating the destruction of humanity's future. And your generation can lead the way just as you, your predecessors have in every great social reform movement. And there is no better place to do it than in the Haas Business School where the way we measure what's good and bad and progress and not in business and investing and finance is in your hands. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. It's hard to go too long. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Terrific. So we do have <laughs> questions. Put them on your cards. I will open up with the question. Can you get me into the Oscars ceremony? <laughs> <laughs> um. how, about, how about a better question? How, how, about, a, how about the question, um, you know, th there are a lot of things that are raising consciousness, and yep. you, you are one of them. Um, there, are, uh, there are natural events that are raising consciousness. Do you see any sort of human-mediated events on the horizon that are going to shift, shift consciousness again in a big way over the next few years? Human-mediated events. Well, um, a, a technology change, a, um, are a, a you, maybe movement. You, uh, uh, we were uh, talking about this satellite that's going to reach station. That's you, you're a great example. Me an you don't have to talk about that, but I love that example. Um, so uh, there is a satellite called uh, Discover, D-S-C-O-V-R, that is that was launched on February 11th that will reach the Lagrangian 1 point, the L1 point, uh, in the middle of June. The L1 point, a as uh, a lot of you know, is a point in space roughly 1 million miles uh, from 1.6 million kilometers from the Earth toward the Sun. And if this is the Sun and this is the Earth going in its orbit around the Sun, a million miles toward the Sun is the place where the gravitational fields of the Earth and the Sun cancel each other out. So a satellite that's placed there stays in between the Earth and the Sun and then co-orbits the Sun with the Earth. And it will give 14 high-resolution, uh, fully illuminated disk images of the Earth every single day. We, we haven't had a fully illuminated disk picture of the Earth uh, since December 7, 1972. That's when the, uh, the famous blue marble photo was taken on Apollo 17, the last of the Apollo missions, and the only Apollo mission where the sun and the moon and the earth were all lined up in a straight line. So it's the only image that's fully illuminated. I'm excited about that. It will also give us uh, the first energy balance for the earth, uh, because what we call the climate crisis or global warming is something we now measure with temperature, which is a very noisy signal. As I mentioned, 80% of the heat energy goes into the oceans. The oceans overturn relatively slowly, so the, the me it's clearly, it's, the signal's easy to see, but the noise level is, is, is nevertheless high. The real phenomena that we've got to be worried about is the, how much heat energy is being, being trapped. So there's a single source. It comes from the sun. We can measure that, but it's re-radiated out into space, also reflected. Uh, 360 degrees, or actually 180 degrees reflected, but 360 degrees re-radiated. And, and we can do okay on the reflect, reflect, reflected energy, but we've never been able to uh, measure 
the, the infrared outflows of energy from, back into space. And the delta, the difference between that and the energy coming in, that's the problem. That's that 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs going off uh, every day, that equivalent of heat energy. So this satellite will give us that with these inspiring images. Uh, and I, I hope that we can find a way to get the same kind of um, uh, consciousness raising that came uh, 42 uh, years ago with that blue marble image or 46 years ago with the Earthrise image taken on Christmas Eve 1968 by uh, the um, uh, Apollo 8 uh, mission. So, so one possibility, we also talked about this and there were a couple of questions suggested around both Paris, the discussion on climate that's going to occur in the fall, and also the uh, proposed, I guess it will be a reality, letter from the Pope, very popular mm. Pope, encyclical letter on climate change. I imagine one could um, take these visuals in these events or with these, uh, the, the, the announcement of the letter or the meetings in Paris and really mm. infuse it with imagery. But what do you think about those two other things that are planned in the next several months? Is leadership going to get us to a successful conclusion or some kind of movement forward in Paris and do you think that the Pope's embrace of this around the world, particularly for developing countries where he's very, very popular, will have an effect on moving things forward? I, I do. Uh, I, I think that uh, Pope Francis is uh, uh, quite a, an inspiring figure, really a, a phenomena. I've been startled with the uh, clarity of the moral force that he mm -hmm. embodies. Uh, and, you know, he kind of raises in a new context the old question, is the Pope Catholic? Uh, and and um, that's a joke, by the way. Uh, but for many Catholics, that might be true. But yes. Well, I, I've said publicly in the last uh, year, I, I was raised in the Southern Baptist tradition, I could become a Catholic because of this mm. Pope. He is that inspiring to me. Mm. And I know, you know, the vast majority of my Catholic friends are just thrilled to the marrow of their bones that he is providing this kind of spiritual leadership. I would like to give credit to his uh, immediate three predecessors as, as uh, Holy Father, who also had very powerful statements on global warming, but uh, Pope Francis is going uh, beyond them, and this encyclical, which evidently is expected uh, around the middle of, of June. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there was a preliminary document that came out just mm -hmm. yesterday. Uh, it is likely to have a very powerful impact. Plus, business is, uh, is also providing real leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, there are more and more businesses that may start uh, advocating sustainability for brand enhancement or because mm -hmm. They want better uh, results with recruitment and retention or because their families are bugging them to do the right thing right. or whatever. But, but uh, some of them just because the CEO and the leadership team believes it. But whatever gets them started, mm -hmm. uh, just like this cost down curve, the happy serendipitous discovery for many of them is that you make money you when, make you money. <laughs> start, <laughs> when you start doing the right thing on, on sustainability. And so um, they're rewarded by their customers and employees and, and executive teams. But the word is now out. This is best practice. And it's best practice in investing also. Mm -hmm. And so um, in almost every area, you see businesses competing to be greener than their co uh, competitors. And some of them are greenwashing, of course. But the internet finds out a lot of that. And we're seeing a, a powerful movement. Now, to Paris in December, November 30th through December 11th, mm -hmm. at the end of this year. We've had a series of uh, international negotiations that have been, to a greater or a lesser degree, disappointing. Uh, Kyoto in 97 uh, actually did a lot. Actually but did the, a lot. It, it did a lot. Led by the vice president. This was a, this was a major well, event. The, uh, but the Senate wouldn't uh, take it up and ratify it. Uh, and, uh, that's another whole. <laughs> that's a whole other hole. That's a, another whole story. But but uh, since then, Copenhagen was a, a disappointing failure, and so many people are cynical. Why get your hopes up about this Paris negotiation? I think it's going to succeed. 
Uh, and it's not a, I don't think it's a Pollyannish prediction at all because the architecture of this notional agreement is very different from the previous ones. Okay. Each nation will select its own national uh, goals mm -hmm. and then those goals will be legally binding within that nation and the entire world will have a chance to, to see who does what and then put pressure on them to do more. The binational agreement between uh, President Obama and President Xi uh, the U.S. and China mm -hmm. uh, last November was a, a, a groundbreaking right. agreement, not least because it shattered the old um, uh, uh, dual uh, category of developed versus developing, mm -hmm. rich versus poor. China's long since crossed over into emerging and their national wealth is so vast now. But they still posed as the leader of the developing bloc. And by reaching this agreement, that, that all changed. Mm -hmm. And China is changing dramatically. They have to. They have, they have to. to. They have uh, to. I mean, life expectancy in northern China has gone down five and a half years from air pollution. The cadmium and mercury and the soils pulled by the roots into their food crops uh, is, is causing uh, disease. Uh, the, the, the lung cancer epidemic is, is beginning to gather some, some force. They've, they've got to do something. They're seeing the diaspora. Uh, coming back now, uh, leaving again in many instances. Uh, business is saying we can't, our, our, we can't in good conscience leave our people in Beijing or Shanghai or, or, or Hong Kong. Uh, and, and so they're really having to change. There's an old phrase, there's a phrase that goes back 2,000 years in China at least called the mandate of heaven. And in the olden times, if there was a giant earthquake that uh, just devastated, it, it was sometimes interpreted by the people as a, a sign from heaven that the leaders, the, the dynasty in charge, had lost its mandate. Oh, and see. that phrase has survived into the post-Mao Zedong era as a kind of people's veto. Mm -hmm. And it's constantly used. Hmm. Uh, and it, it is, you know, when they see thousands of dead hogs coming down the river, they say, oh, you know, uh, we need to rethink this deal maybe. And the, the government is very much attuned to this, very much attuned to it. Xi Jinping is, uh, and his PM are now moving aggressively. They're introducing a nationwide cap and trade, cap and trade. system one year from this quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, they've already piloted it in uh, two, two uh, uh, cities and five, two provinces and five cities and the list is growing every day. They've now put in a mandate for reporting of CO2 emissions by large uh, businesses. And the, another old saying is, the mountain is high and the emperor is far away. Well, it turns out, in the age of the internet, the emperor's not that uh, far no. away. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we'll get an agreement mm -hmm. in Paris. Right. One of my favorite uh, lines of poetry is from a great American poet in the last century, Wallace Stevens, who was a business guy before he became a full-time poet, and he wrote a line that goes like this, after the last no comes a yes, and on that yes, the future world depends. Uh, and there were lots of no's in all the other great social movements, but after the final no came a yes, and we, we have to get to yes on this, and I think we will this December. That's, that's phenomenal. Why don't you, you can stick with the, with the questions that have come in. Well, the questions, actually, we had a couple of questions which really were MBAs asking the question of how to develop a career in sustainability. I think you've, you've touched on this in terms of the number of companies that are moving yeah. this direction, the number of investment funds that are moving in this direction. Um, there's a, a, a movement uh, to develop a whole new set of social accounting standards, which I'm sure you know about. SASB. SASB to move. They're, and they're all supposed to come out this Gen summer. Generation gave the seed money grant to set up SASB. Well, SASB, and they're finishing up. Their, 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 their whole set of preliminary estimates are going to come so. out this summer. Something like uh, 75 to 80% of our students at Haas take a course in the sustainability Fantastic. or social Fantastic. impact area. So they are looking for career opportunities, but I think that basically look for the, the companies that are working uh, active. Look for the companies that Generation has identified as yeah. having long-term sustainability as their defining uh, goal, and I think you find the employers out there to, to move in that direction. A absolutely, and, and uh, those of you who leave this uh, school and go out into the marketplace looking for jobs, some of you will you know, go into the nonprofit sector. I know many of you have 
a wide range of plans, uh, 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 social enterprises, et cetera, but a, a lot of you will go into the, uh, the for-profit business world. You will find, and those of, you, those of you in the interview process have already found, that companies are really hungry right now for the kinds of insights you can bring to their thinking about sustainability. They know that millennials and so-called centennials, those born after 97, have a sustainability way higher mm -hmm. up their uh, list of values. And there, a lot of businesses are, are kind of waking up to this and realizing that if they didn't know they had to change before, they really think they do have to change now. And they see many of you as potentially the carriers of the insights that they need in order to make the transition that they're trying to figure out how to navigate. And of, of course, many of you have long since decided that you, you want to make good money and have a very comfortable income stream and a high quality of life, but you want to do it in a context where your, your, your work and the hours you put in ha has, has a larger meaning too. And it just means so much to be a part of an enterprise that's not just about the bottom line, that does have higher values. And th this is a revolution that is really accelerating in the business world. And again, I don't want to be Pollyannish no, about it because we all know they're laggards and corner cutters and we all know that there, there are rule, rules of the road <coughs> that have to change. We need to stop subsidizing pollution, subsidizing the use of carbon fuels and a lot of other things. But in spite of all that, we are uh, making headway now. And I, I think you're going to have some great opportunities in, in significant measure because of uh, the sustainability uh, uh, curriculum here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I apologize, but we have to take this to a close. Vice President Gore, you have lifted the perspective and consciousness of so many people. <laughs> and your being here today has lifted this many more. We thank you. Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you.